the idea of unlocking unlimited potential is basically that inside all of us is an infinite power that once we learn to harness, control, and unleash, that it becomes contagious among our students and they become able to achieve new levels and new heights and, and learn you know, as much as possibly can in an, in an amazing environment. That's unlocking and limited potential in a nutshell. It's broke up into three parts. Uh, the first part of the book is the, the foundation, building the foundation. So the foundation of the book is your why, your growth mindset, your social emotional learning, your core values. The second part of the book is using challenges as opportunities for growth. That's looking at all different stories that have gone on and looking at stories in my life as well um, as being a monolingual bilingual educator and the discovery of, of what that meant for me and how that changed my life. And I dedicated my doctorate program to writing a dissertation about an area of teaching, which I was extremely uncomfortable in um, so that I could have an impact and a better impact. And I learned so much through the process and that kind of led me to actually writing this book. Um, and then that there's also a chapter in there about COVID in that section, using challenges as opportunities to growth. And the title of the chapter is when one door closes, a virtual one opens. And what I did for that chapter is I invited about 10 different authors, Brian Aspinall, Michelle Greer, my principal, um, Jonathan Alzheimer, Dave Schmidto, the Staff Room Podcast, just a lot of people from my like professional learning network. And they all wrote a reflection about just their take. So we had podcasters, we had teachers, we had superintendent Darren Pepper in Colorado. We had a retired principal, Frank Redneski in, Ju in New Jersey. We had Brian Aspinall, who is a professor and runs a publishing company and is, you know, all greatness. Mm -hmm. And we had everybody else. And that chapter was really amazing. And that was part of it. Just seeing it from their lens was really interesting. And also that and then the third part of the book is believing in you. So taking all of this and connecting it now to some of the work and some of the research that's out there, but in a in a friendly, good way, but most importantly, not just like your this is your, you know, your Dewey and this is your your bloom and this is your John Wooden, but it's now this is your Tony Robbins. This is your Jack Canfield. This is your Bob Proctor. And I try to tie in personal development authors because they're littered throughout the book because I'm a huge fan of their work and their work has kind of led me onto this path of writing this book. And I always wanted this book to be able to reach a wide audience. So it's not just a book written for a teacher, a mm -hmm. new teacher. It's for everybody. It's a teacher, a new teacher, a veteran teacher, a parent, a principal, a superintendent, a director, a speaker, an author. It's written for anybody who wants to kind of know what it takes to be a better teacher each and every single day and to live up to this credo of unlocking unlimited potential. So when, like, like I obviously, uh, cause of my work with innovators mindset, trying to extend like what goes beyond growth mindset and kind of talking about it. Like I, I've always talked about looking for those opportunities, you know, when there's obstacles and things like that. And one of the things that I've, kind of been bothered with with growth mindset stuff is not like the theory of it but how it's been used in a way to kind of like kind of just it push people into places that they don't they have actually have no interest in going right and i think a lot of times it's used as a compliance tool right so like hey if you don't agree with me like well, you need a growth mindset it's like maybe i just don't agree with you like maybe i actually and, and like i always give the analogy like you can say i have a you can say you have a growth mindset all you want. I don't have a growth mindset towards skydiving. Like I'm not, I'm not, there's nothing you could do to talk me into saying like, Ooh, that's something I could develop it and grow in. And I, I've, I've also watched administrators, um, administrators asking teachers to have a growth mindset about certain practices, uh, that they're trying to implement. Yet I see a lot of those administrators doing stuff the way they did 10, 15 years ago and not necessarily connecting. And so how do you see that notion of 
growth mindset when you're talking about a student, like, like I, I made the analogy um, when we were talking before, there's pretty much nothing you could have done to get me interested in science. And science is just, and I, I'm okay saying this, it's not my thing and I'm fine with it being other people's things, but there's lots of things that I do very well. There's lots of things I'm really interested in. So how do you see that connected when it's really hard to see a student maybe just doesn't have a passion for what you have a passion for? There's so much to be said about that. I could talk for hours, but I think all in what you're saying, there's a couple of things. I think the first thing you're saying is that you had people who were just preaching and throwing around the word saying, mm -hmm. you got to have a growth mindset. Well, okay, there's one thing saying it, and then there's another thing doing it and living it and actually being a, a solid model for it. And there's also something about making relationships and connections. I mean, if I'm throwing around words like growth mindset and saying, Hey, you have to have a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. I don't really think, I think I'm missing the ball because I don't really know my, understand my relationship with that person well enough. And I'm not leading in something the right way. This, the second thing I would say, I would go back to as well is it's more than just the growth mindset. It's not just the growth mindset mm -hmm. is yes, that's a piece of it. And the growth mindset, the ability, you know, the, the belief in that abilities can be cultivated is a truth. Yes, mm -hmm. they can. They can be cultivated. We have to find that way to cultivate them. And it might not be that they're passionate about the topic, but do we know their story? Do Have we given kids the, the opportunity to know their story? I mean, education is, is, you know, one foot in the past and the other foot in the future. And we're just kind of in the, are we in the middle? Which end of it of that are we close to? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's this whole part of emotional learning that we've really dropped the ball on. And I mean, I didn't ever talk about feelings when I was in school. I didn't really, I, I didn't have a chance to sit down and actually just have my teacher kind of kick back and be like, hey, how are you doing? I, mean, I don't think, I don't remember that a lot. And I think that now that we've had a pandemic to finally say here, and especially in America, I'm not, I, and I believe as well in, in Canada, and I'd say across North America, we finally are saying, hey, mental health matters. Mm -hmm. Hey, we can talk about feelings now. I think the issue is that if the reason that people don't have a, gro a growth mindset is because they've lost something somewhere, or perhaps that they just stop believing in that. And maybe they just don't understand their feelings. I know a lot of people out there that don't understand. Sometimes they talk because they're uncomfortable or sometimes they say things and they don't even realize the intent of some of those things, how they are being heard or how they're being perceived. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's that emotional piece too. I, there's no, the growth mindset is in so many different things. I don't believe there's one thing out there that you're going to say like, Hey, you need to have a growth mindset. Well, mm -hmm. I think if you're saying that to your staff, you need to wonder why your staff is pushing back first. Right. And if you don't know why your staff is pushing back and you're saying, forget it and ignore it, well, that's just not how you lead. Yeah. And I think for me, the, the connection, and you made a good point to understanding the, the stories of the people you serve. And it is much easier for me to, and I, I always give this example, right? So let's say I'm not really into reading, right? Not that I can't read. I just don't like reading books. And you make me read books that I don't have interest in and I don't want to read. And then you're like, well, you need to have a growth mindset about this. I'm like, well, what would happen if you actually said, hey, this guy knows loves basketball. If I can get him reading basketball books, he probably yeah. would cover the curriculum and have that too, right? And so- Or comic it, books. Right. And it, I it, mean, maybe- Graphic novels it. too, right? And so I, I think yeah. part of it is is understanding like there's a way to actually, like that doesn't mean I'm going to be a writer. It doesn't mean that I'm going to, but it, I think part of it is figuring out ways to connect to the students' interests and passions and tapping into that to bring the subject area to life. So it might not actually um, make me an English teacher in the future, but maybe it'll actually equip me to go into some, some something that has to do with basketball and, and see the connection between the two, right?